thank you so much for being here, everybody. Um, you guys are better than donuts. Um, and I really want to say thank you to the center for having me. Um, as was mentioned, um, the center was generous enough to provide a grant and writing space and some really cool dinners. Um, so thank you for that. And also, one other thing I'd like to say is that um, the Center's Literary Journal, um, The Literarian, published my first piece of fiction, my first short story, so the Center means the world to me. <clears throat> I'm going to start getting beepy now. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm going to read a couple of short passages from the book, and then we'll watch a video. Um, so, the first passage is uh, after the protagonist of The Hopeful has had a career-ending injury. Uh, and she can no longer figure skate, which is her great love in life. Like, uh, you know, everybody's is, right? Um, so, the summer after the accident, I turned into someone who didn't resemble a younger version of my mother. One day, I was sharp as a blade. The next, there was gore in my pants that meant I was a woman. What I saw in the mirror could not swindle physics, but was a swindled physique. I suggested an hourglass of slipping sand. My mother's concerns were about the development of my mind, not my body, however, so she hired a tutor for me, worrying that years of homeschooling had left me behind my peers. His name was Mark Arecchio, and he was 24 years old and taking time off from his doctorate program to campaign for a third-party politician most voters didn't know existed, a little big voice communist named Leonard Leonards, who had famously thrown himself in front of a bulldozer to, uh, to protect an independent bookstore as the former books, uh, bookstore owner yelled, stop hamming it up. She had sold the store to a chain and was moving the next day to a gated community for people who didn't work anymore. They showed this film clip on the news when Leonard's announced his candidacy with a speech titled, A Piece of the American Pie for All. Evidently, this speech had excited Mark and my mother got a lucky deal on an almost PhD. The day we met, my mother brought him up to my room before she left for the salon. I was still in bed, steaming beneath the covers, and even when I saw two pale green eyes lighting across me, even when I realized this was the first man to come into my room that wasn't my father, I stayed in the sulk of my sweaty linens. Lying is no way to live, my mother said. She figured company would embarrass me vertical, or at least into mascara. I was wearing leggings, my unbrushed hair twizzled into dark filigree. My only excuse for the degradation of my hygiene was that I was down one identity, and there was no longer anyone left I wanted to try to be. I can't bend at the hips, I said. How will I sit? I pointed to my torso, where under a t-shirt, I wore a medical corset to form my spine properly. Cruelly called an immobilizer, it pitched me erect, and because it extended over the tops of my thighs, I couldn't sit, nor could I walk so much as waddle side to side like a metronome, my torso swinging in the sweat-drenched synthetics. If sitting was a sow cow, you'd find a way, my mother said. If sitting was a sow cow, I definitely wouldn't be able to do it, I said. I just want to finish my coffee in bed. Mark rushed into the conversation. <clears throat> coffee is how I got through grad school. He didn't speak so much as blurt, and immediately I liked his awkward valor. Coffee is how I got through starving, I returned. <laughs> to be afraid or to laugh, he looked to wonder. To getting through, I said, and he raised his paper cup as though we were celebrating. To getting through. My mother departed quickly. Mark took his hand in and out of his pockets, then sat at the end of my bed. I'm Mark, he said. He held one hand above my body. I'm pathetic, I said. And self-effacing, he said, a virtuoso. When he smiled, his cheeks wrinkled like disturbed pond water. He started talking about himself, about graduate school, about not being in graduate school, about Leonard Leonard's, about communism. All I knew of communism, I told Mark, were unfair advantages. Until the Soviet Union dissolved, communist countries turned out some of the best skaters in the world, while only moneyed families could afford the expense of figure skating in the United States. Soviet skaters were fed caviar, trained and professionally massaged with government funding. The Eastern Bloc had had an advantage, and even now, for an American to take lessons from a former Soviet was somewhere between chic and treacherous. 
Figure skating, Marx said, smiling, is not much different than American politics. But figure skating was much fairer than American democracy, I thought. In rinks, the justice of corporate reality trumped patriotism. At one point, I had been between Filthy Phil and the Russian. Lauren had been my coach for years, but sometimes I wanted that sow cow more than I wanted not to hurt her. Filthy Phil got his name from his five o'clock shadow and the way he touched his girls' butts. All the coaches touched their students' butts. It was the only way to make us feel how our bodies should be positioned for certain skating movements. They grabbed and pulled our pelvises forward. They called this being beneath ourselves. And being beneath ourselves was the only way to turn correctly in the air. The parents said that for filthy Phil, butts weren't just business. That left the Russian. Better, that, better dead than red to some, but he does get results, my father had said. The judges couldn't argue with the sow cow. So you went with the Russian, Mark asked? No, I said. In the end, I stayed with Lauren, maybe because I loved her. She had drilled me until I landed double loops, scratched out odd-bodied spins. There was genius to her methods, the innovations that flipped pain into the appearance of ease. I remembered when I was breaking in new skates, my feet, bloody pus blistered, and how she sent me running barefoot on a trail of broken seashells in the parking lot. You want to know pain, she called. Pain is not cutting it. Pain is falling short. Pain is not making it. Are you in pain, Allie? Are you in pain? I pounded over the seashells. No, no, no. No, no, no pain. Until nothing could hurt me, except the things I thought. The mistakes all my doing. Like the one that broke my back and made me a normal girl, wallowing through summer tutoring. Tell me more, Mark said. And I did, though for him, it was just a blip in the Cold War. For me, it was the only thing worth fighting for. Um, so I'm going to read another passage, short one. Um, and this is when Allie, who's the protagonist, goes to visit her cousin Lucy. She needs money uh, for amphetamines, just like we all do. Um, so she's gone to go uh, get some of that. <clears throat> Lucy opened the door wearing a swirly pastel teddy with little margarita glasses she had embroidered into the bust. Sewing was a hobby she had taken up after leaving college. I call this look Jimmy Buffett loses his lunch in eternal spring, she told me. Speaking of, I'm starving. Are you going to eat that? She pointed to my arm, grabbed it, and gnawed on the part below the elbow like a corn on the cob. She'd been pretending to eat my arm since I was a kid. It was how she said, I love you. What other looks have you got? I asked. A night on the town with James Bond in cerulean satin. That's the one with martini glasses, shaken, not stirred, of course. And then there's the Marlboro Man takes Manhattan in scarlet passion. That's the one with cigarettes over a grid pattern. Are all of your designs vices? If you can't do dress, have I taught you nothing, Bobo? I looked at her stomach. Lucy had never been pregnant for longer than four months before, but this time she had an intercepted nature. My own mother had told people she was expecting, even though she wasn't showing. You don't look like you're about to give birth, people would tell her, and she'd respond that beauty was in the eye of the beholder. She and my father took me from a woman at the airport, and when they told a waitress that night I was their new baby, the entire restaurant clapped for the family that had been created through sheer will. Their dreams hadn't been withheld by biology, so why should mine? Well, don't just stand there staring, Lucy said. Sit down and take a good look. She sat me on a recliner and lifted her shirt up. Wiggling the teddy side to side like a can-can dancer, she made a little diagonal kick, then pushed her butt out and put her hands on her hips for a silhouette view. Her stomach looked like what I'd imagined as a child would happen if you swallowed a watermelon seed. Well, she asked, what do you think? Am I everything you expected? More, I answered. I hadn't seen her in some time. When you're young, you think you know everything, she said. I always thought I needed a boob job, and all I really needed was a bun in the oven out of wedlock. Do you see these puppies? She pushed the dead weight she was carrying through her chest up toward her neck. It's difficult not to since you're wearing lingerie, Lucy. Oh, Vovo, pregnancy is science fucking fiction. Listen to me, a person growing inside of me. It's not fiction, it's just science. 
Like I've been implanted with sperm, I said. That's the science part. I'm making a life for somebody else, she said. It's more than most people have ever done for me. It's more than I could ever have done for myself. It's a goddamn miracle. I'm happy for you, I said, though the unanswered question on my mind was who had made her into a science exhibition. But Vovo, are you happy with me? From me? Don't piss on my back and tell me it's rain. Does the father know? Nice girls should be seen and not heard, she purred, suddenly all clasped hands and crossed knees, winking and folding into a false position of demureness. And I suppose nice girls finish three trimesters, I said. She set her mouth flat. The father's not my business anyway, I added quickly. The body was hers. The bodies, plural, were hers. You don't have to say who. The father remains to be seen, Lucy answered. She bit into a candy bar and wiped chocolate finger smears on the chair upholstery. It's narrowed down, obviously, but, you know, one day in a couple of years when the baby looks like something more than a fat suit, I'll be running after it playing tag, and it will glance back at me, and I'll say, oh, it's that fucker Sean, or sweet Jesus, isn't he the spitting image of that bastard Albert? Like love, I'll know it when I see it. I thought of my mother telling her little girl, you could be anyone. You dated a guy named Albert? It's the law of paradox, Bobo, shrimpy name, big cucumber. But still a bastard or a fucker? What do you want from me, Lucy asked. Do you know where we live? We are so into nowhere, we aren't even in the sticks. We're in the stick. We're sticking, we're stuck. We're left to fuck goddamn slim pickings. And anyway, don't you know the phrase for love is falling in? Falling could be like hiccups. Once you started, it was hard to stop, and the only way you could quit mopping the ice was not to think about it. You had to breathe deep, scare yourself out of it, think about the right next thing. Otherwise, you ended up in a pattern of failure and your year was done. And wasn't this conversation just a series of hiccups? I breathed deep. I tried to figure out what the right thing to do was. Here was a girl between a bastard and a fucker, and I was going to ask her for money. I told Lucy she could munch my arm if she wanted. Sweet Bobo, she said, I'm just a belly full of hormones right now, and my cooch hasn't been getting anywhere at all lately. Don't mind me. What can I do? You can't. It's illegal for cousins in every state above the Mason-Dixon line, she winked. There's got to be something. Invent alcoholic non-alcohol. Invent smokeless smokes. Invent fat-free fat pregnancy. Anything else? Tell me a story that will get my mind out of the gutter. I'm an insatiable single mom. It's a social service I'm owed. Okay, so. Um, so we're gonna watch a little video now. And this is also from the book. Um, there's a scene in the book where um, this character is remembering uh, watching a video when she was younger with her father, a figure skating video. And uh, this is this video. In the video, as she glides toward the center of the ice, Quan looks like she is about to cry, like the 15-year-old she is. There is no turning back. But then her music, Salome, descends like a humid heat onto the spectators. The music connotes the desperate sensuality of a woman who danced so that her mother could collect the head of John the Baptist. And Quan takes a beautifully smooth half circumference around the rink before vaulting into the air for a triple lutz double toe loop combination. She lands another triple double.
Then the triple flip. As one of the commentators says, if she keeps up this kind of jumping with this kind of wonderful choreography, this could be a gold medal performance. It's a reminder, this is only the beginning of her program. When she lands her double axel, Quan extends the landing for a few seconds in a show of mastery from the classic landing position, arching her arm like a weeping willow before a pivot. The music then slows to rich stringed instrumentation and Quan's movements appear to reach with the pain of wanting something so badly. Two more triple jumps, and the music chimes frenetically as she spins, signaling the last third of her program. She takes the length of the ring with such speed she appears frictionless. And with the landing of a triple lutz, she is. There are no triple jumps left. The obvious dangers of her program are gone. But then a high note sounds, and she rips her hands past her face with ferocity. And there's something in that motion as she reaches to the lights above that would make anyone's skin prickle. It is a moment as strange and frightening as a Hitchcock film. She prepares to enter her last jump, the double axel, but at the last moment changes her mind and then tries for another triple. She jabs her left kick. It's a gamble, the move of someone who will risk a mistake for a chance of greatness. She lands the jump as the music crashes to an end. And then, there she is, crying, a 15-year-old again, knowing she's done her best and that that might mean the best in the world. She can barely keep it together to bow. When I looked over at my father, he was crying right along with Michelle Kwan. In the video, the scores come up for technical merit, five nines and five eights. Then, for artistic merit, there are two sixes, two nods of perfection, one from Bulgaria and the other from Japan. The camera pans to her parents in the stands, and the commentator says, Danny Kwan, so completely excited for his daughter. <laughs>
And she's also an icon because she's somebody who just stuck around. Um, she wasn't somebody who tried and failed and then gave up. She just kept trying and having these sort of terrible failures amidst all of these other successes. And I think that's what's really intriguing about her, is that she just kept trying. Speaking of trying and uh, over time, can you tell us a little about how The Hopeful came to be? Sure. Um, so The Hopeful first um, was a six-page short story. And I worked on that for a while. I sort of developed it and turned it into a novel. Um, at the time, I had just uh, started working with my wonderful agent, Kirby Kim. Um, yay, Kirby. And I like to say, Kirby Kim for president. Um, but I had just started working with Kirby, and he gave me some great notes um, on the book. And uh, I did a large revision, and then we submitted it for publication. And that took a while. And uh, then I revised it again with my editor, but those were very small things. Um, so yeah, but the, like a lot of novels, it's just years of my life. Years and yeah. years, mm -hmm. right. The discipline it takes is, is always a surprise to many people who maybe haven't done the insane thing that is writing a novel. Mm -hmm. So where did the figure skating come in? How did, how did you know you wanted to write a novel about, about that topic? Um, well, I should definitely mention I did figure skate when I was younger, okay. so there's that. Um, but also, um, you know, figure skating is such an intriguing and strange world, and for a couple of reasons. One, it's this, uh, this world in which women are the paradigm, and that was really interesting to me. It's essentially women and then predominantly gay men, you know, on the men's side. Um, and that is not the culture that um, is the rest of the world, so I liked that. Um, I also felt that it was uh, a world where very physical actions were combined with artistry, and it kind of, for me, tested the limits of um, sort of a Cartesian mind-body divide. Um, and then also, figure skating is something that a lot of people think is silly, and that made me really want to write about it. <laughs> Who thinks figure skating is silly? That's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> the world you're describing of women and, and gay men sounds a lot like heaven to me. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if you know when you asked me, but I am an enormous figure skating fan and have been since I was a little girl. I watched figure skating. It was it was it captured your imagination to feel like you could glide the way they do. I've only figure skated, and that's actually giving me a lot of credit. I only tried on skates and went on the ice once, though, and it was horrifying. And it's such a hard thing to do. And I think one of the reasons I loved The Hopeful so much is that it really gets in the head of someone who can do on the ice what like 95% of people can't do on solid ground. And that's an amazing perspective to explore. Um, the main character's name, one of the best main character's names, I think, of all time, Ali Vopro Doyle. Mm -hmm. Ali Vopro. She's called Ali and Vovo at different times in the book. Um, can you tell us a little of, so, okay, so she's a really dedicated young figure skater. Was that your experience growing up? Did you have her childhood? I would not say that I had her childhood. <laughs> Can you tell us a little about what her childhood was? Okay, sure. So in the book, um, you know, she is an obsessive figure skater. It's really the only thing that she's interested in. Um, and she is uh, supported very much by her father, um, who uh, is also obsessed with figure skating. And her mother is, is not uh, at all. And her mother would much prefer that they lived a regular life and went on vacations and ate fattening foods and um, did all the, the things that most of the people in this room enjoy doing. Um, and that, that was not the case with me. I ate a lot of fattening foods when I was growing up. Um, but uh, definitely I was very enamored with figure skating. I will say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and, and then she has the career ending injury. But her obsession with it, I mean, she's so talented. It seems like she is a very talented figure skater. Mm -hmm. There's also an obsession that goes along with it. I mean, some of the details in the book were ha kind of harrowing. Like, at one point, her friend Ryan gives her the advice that she can lose a lot of weight if she fidgets. So they both fidget as much as they can. And he says something like, if you move your leg, you'll lose 35 pounds by next week. That kind of thing. And I felt like that is so specific and, and harrowing. And is that the way it, it really gets when you're on that level in that kind of sport? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would definitely say that it is. I mean, another, I guess another part that's sort of similar to what you're talking about is this same character advises uh, Allie uh, that if she's not performing well, that she should, you know, go in the bathroom, shove a toothbrush down her throat, and, and throw up, right? Which is definitely part of that culture as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's almost inevitable that she collapses underneath the pressure in a way. Mm -hmm. And so she ends up um, in the hospital. And, and the book takes a really sad and, and poignant turn as we follow her through that, the experience of getting better and healing. And I, I felt toward the end that it was basically the experience of learning how to love yourself and, and forgive yourself for not being that, you know, for not being Michelle Kwan. I mean, what, did, you, did you feel that love, like the idea of self-love was, was something that you wanted to explore? Um, yeah, I would say more broadly, love in general. One of the things that I think this character really is interested in is where love comes from. Where does it derive? And so she essentially believes that you can't control love. It just sort of arrives onto a, a person. Um, you can't decide to love something or decide not to love something. And this is uh, something that's really painful for her. And of course, this is something that is also explored philosophically in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, if we look at somebody like Bourdieu, who talks about taste, well, he doesn't talk about love specifically, but it's very similar, right? This idea that what we like arrives at us through, uh, you know, through class or through culture, um, or arrives at us sort of in this discursive way. And she would rather just think of it as not the fate of class, not the fate of culture, but just that somehow, magically, love has descended on her, and her great love is figure skating, it's not a person, and she is not interested in loving people. This is something that's a huge part of her character. She wants to love something that's going to be only hers. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when do you think that her obsession becomes something that is or when is, or what is like love for sport, or love for something even like, say, writing? When does it become unhealthy? When does it become an obsession, do you think? Um, I don't know. I guess I, I envision a Venn diagram. Do we all remember the Venn diagram? <laughs> if we teach, yeah, we, have, we have definitely talked about the Venn diagram. So the concentric, the, not concentric, the circles that overlap. And I think that for some people love and obsess about certain things. and then, there's also the separate as well. Okay. So that's, that's a lovely way to see it. I wonder how, did you see any similarities between her, you know, her discipline and, and the idea of writing a book? There are many times that I was relating to her, and obviously I'm not a figure skater, but I was relating to her in the way that you, know, you have to be so focused to write something like a novel. Did you source that in any way with your own love for writing? Um, well, actually, I did just write an essay about how writing is similar to a sport in certain ways. And oh. um, yeah, I guess right. That's cool. Yeah, there you go. Um, you're so precious. I've always said that about you. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think that uh, yeah. Writing can be quite a bit like a sport in that it is something that requires a huge amount of discipline, and it's also something that people put a ton of work into without any guarantees. It's not going to medical school where no matter what, at the end of it, if you just do everything you're supposed to do, you get a medical degree. 
there are plenty of extremely talented writers, many of whom I know, who work extremely hard and who I think deserve to be totally famous and wealthy and have a million books published, and that's, <laughs> that's not the case. Right. Um, so both of those, um, those things kind of are similar, yeah. It does seem in figure skating, though, if you do a certain amount of jumps and the jumps are a certain level of difficulty that you could that you could, that's all you need. Like it's, it all comes down to math in a certain way, I feel like especially now mm -hmm. in figure skating. Um, but did Michelle Kwan ever win, end up winning the gold? She never won the Olympic gold medal. She never no. did. What do you think, so one year it was Tara Lipinski who won, if I recall, and the next it was um, Sarah, Sarah Hughes, Hughes. Yeah. who kind of like skated in from nowhere right. that year, right? And she was just like, here I am, and I won, oh my god. And she's like one of, that, one of those girls that seemed to yeah. was like, how did this even happen to me? Yeah. And you hated her because you knew Michelle <laughs> Kahn was like, I've spent four years like living and breathing and eating this comeback. Mm -hmm. And then and then to have it not happen. Right. Do you think there was something that was standing in her way mentally? Or do you think she wanted it too much? Yeah, I think she probably did want it too much. Definitely was mental. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in the book is this idea of where the self resides. So, does the self reside in the body, in the mind, or in that metacognitive mind? So, if there's sort of the subconscious mind that functions in a way that feels uncontrollable, and then there's this other part that looks down on it and says, "Don't, don't do that, right? Like, we're we're going to do this instead." You know, is it that metacognitive mind? Is it the the subconscious mind or is it the body? That's not even getting into the soul. Mm -hmm. um, but Michelle Michelle Kwan's problem was that she had a hard time sort of controlling uh, her mind and, and therefore her body. Yeah. So I'm sure there are people in the audience who are also working on their first books. Was there anything that surprised you in the process, or any advice you would like to give to oh. people who are doing that now? Um, <laughs> at the computer. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't ever leave the computer. <laughs> Never ever leave the computer. Don't sleep, don't eat. No. Um, stay at the computer uh, and read. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that when you're stuck, the best thing that you can possibly do is to read until you start feeling excited about language again. What kind of things did you read while you were writing The Hopeful? Oh, lots of stuff. Um, End Zone by Ronda Lillo, which is a fabulous novella set in the world of football actually. Um, and uh, I read some Amy Hempel. Uh, I read some Laurie Moore. Um, I read uh, The Tempest. <laughs> um, and The Tempest is quoted in the book. Um, I read also like Wittgenstein. And so I think reading broadly and sort of just seeing what lots of people do with that material of language is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to um, have enough time we're almost at an hour. I want to have enough time for the audience to ask their questions. I'm sure a lot of you have questions about how to do a sow cow and what that actually means. I can coach you <laughs> for a lot of time. I'm sure Tracy would love to answer any questions about figure skating or the book or the process. Um, hey, Tracy. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. Thanks for bringing the cookies. No problem. Oh, this seems like a planted question. <laughs> I'm sweating right now. Um, I guess, like, as someone who's written and loved it, I feel like for me, it's not <clears throat> like it's not sports writing. And I feel like we focused on figure skating and Michelle Kwan and like. I guess I would want to know what you would say your book is about if you took away. Figure skating for a moment. Question. Yeah, um, I think that's a really great question because, in a way, figure skating is how I instantiated the themes, um, but it, it's not necessarily a book about figure skating, if that makes any sense. So, what to me, what the book is about is what happens um, to somebody's desire um, if it is essentially stripped away from them. So, if somebody wants something very badly, and that is their, their purpose in life, and it's taken away, 
what happens after that? So, you know, there are a number of different types of failure that we can recognize, and this is one that's so obvious, right? It's a failure of the body, but for somebody else, it might be that, I don't know, that they are writing a book, and uh, the great book that they think they're writing doesn't get published, right? They just get rejection after rejection after rejection. Or I could have said it in the world of lawyers, and there is that one case you know, like the one case that matters so much that um, the lawyer can't win. Um, so, yeah, it, it's sort of about what you do after failure. Yeah. Did you feel more pressure after you got the fellowship? Did I feel? No, not at all. Um, actually, it was this. It was this great thing because. I think I was trying to describe this earlier, and I was failing a little bit, but the center has just been the, the, the best thing that happened to me, like the best institution that ever happened to me. Um, you know, between publishing my first story, inviting me to do readings, the fellowship, and you know, even uh, I worked with an editor um, on this book through the center as well. So it, it didn't add any pressure, it just sort of made me feel like I wasn't doing it alone, which is something that most writers never get. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky. And, and the camaraderie among the fellows, did you feel like that was, did that, did they all gel as well and help each other out? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, we, you know, we did a lot of awkward events together, and nothing, <laughs> and nothing brought me together more than feeling completely awkward as a group. <laughs> That's the emerging part. That's the emerging part. That's, that's why the emerging. That's because you haven't emerged yet. Then you emerge and you never feel awkward again. Right. Yeah, we've broken out of our shell. <laughs> yeah, and then you leave your shell behind. And I was what do you mean now? The first, I guess I was, I was in the first cohort, right before you, of the fellows. And it was, and we're still, we would still do anything for each other. It was a really, it's, in New York City, it's, it's tough to write every day, and it's tough to be a writer. And to have six, seven, eight other people trying to do the same thing and have a space that you can go to regularly to see them and to talk about it was really valuable. Mm -hmm. And still and it still remains very valuable, clearly. Yeah. Because things like this get to happen. Yeah. These awkward things yes. you know, go on. New <laughs> awkward things. New fancy. <laughs> um, oh, okay, okay, so speaking of emerging writers, um, you said something really something that I thought was really witty at Ian McEwen <laughs> when he asked you and I actually used this when I applied for residency and <laughs> for he, he, he said so you're an emerging writer what does that mean and you're like I guess that means I get to keep my bartending job <laughs> so how do you, That's true. How do you have you know this amazing novel out and it's presented do you feel like how do you know that you're not an emerging writer anymore that there, I feel like in the arts there's always that gray area you know but I just wanted to hear what you thought. I think that the hope is that you're always emerging, actually. I would hate to think that I had reached a, a place where I was not emerging anymore. I feel like every day you should be pushing past a certain limit that's existed before in your work. Um, so I, I hope to keep emerging. I know that's not really what you meant. Um, I think one way of measuring it is that really practical answer, which is, how much do you have to work outside of your art form to be able to, you know, do things like pay rent, you know, assuming that you don't have a trust fund or a very wealthy uh, husband or wife or some other um, sugar daddy like arrangement? <laughs> I guess if you don't have to do those things, that helps. Yeah. Um, you spoke earlier about how the hopeful originated as a short story, and I'm curious to know if you can expand a little on the mechanical aspect of how you went from six pages to a whole novel. Um, I think a lot of people tell emerging writers, you know, get your short stories out there, but they're so different in form and structure from a novel. Um, so I'm curious to know like, how you made that transformation. Well, I guess I was lucky in that the story that existed, nothing really happened, right? All that happened was that somebody got out of bed. Um, so there was still plenty of story left to tell, right? I felt that that particular moment encapsulated something important, which is something we all go through, is waking up in the morning and saying, okay, why is my life worth living today? You know, why do I go about my day? 
you know, why don't I just stay in bed or like watch Mad Men for 12 hours in a row? Or maybe that is the way that you get out of bed, right? Maybe that is your reason for living. Um, but it's it started with with that, and I had to sort of think about well, what happens after she does get out of bed, right? What happens if she goes about her daily life? And the other thing was that I needed to think about the people in her life because it was really sort of insular. It was in one point of view. She's pretty much the only character in that section. And so I needed to think about what the different facets of her life would look like. So like one thing that I thought about was, okay, she's a teenager who has been in this sort of asexual world. Is she going to go get it on, right? Like, is this going to be something that she's interested in? And so I just had to ask myself those questions, I think. And then did your agent help you, did Kirby help you flesh it out as well? Or did you wait until you had a draft before you showed anyone? I kind of, I feel like I might not be remembering this correctly, and Kirby can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that most of the novel was already there when Kirby and I first met. Mm -hmm. But then he definitely helped me think about how to sort of create a little bit more momentum earlier or move some events around, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Oh. Yeah, Matthew. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and you, and I was curious you. about what you were saying with uh, the, the three things, the, the subconscious, the conscious, the body. I'm curious to get your thoughts on how you uh, feel that applies to your writing. Like, where does your writing come from in that triple header kind of way? And how does that relate to you doing your best? How do you stay balanced with those things? Wow, well, that's, that's such a good one. Yeah. Good luck with that one. <laughs> 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 no, please. Oh, jeez. I'll catch you if you fall. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I'll say this that um, a lot of times I feel like I need to sort of circle around an idea for a long time before I can put anything on the page, and I wait a really long time. I'm not somebody who writes a lot and then cuts it down. Um, so, you know, I guess you could call it marinating. I'm letting the ideas marinate, and maybe they're marinating in my subconscious, but then I'm also actively pursuing them. So maybe it's trying to write about them in a different way. Right? like writing about them in nonfiction, writing about them in a more rhetorical way, taking notes. Um, but I think that something really interesting happens when you're actually trying to put a sentence, a narrative sentence together. And um, that is a marriage of those subconscious parts and the conscious parts. Obviously, nobody who writes really wants to hear that, right? Because we all want to think that we're in control every step of the way, you know, um, but I have, for example, had dreams and then woken up and thought, okay, I know what I'm going to do now. So, um, yeah. I think that is a great answer. I think that, um, I think that not writing is a very valuable part of the process of writing, I would say. And um, another writer I know Adam Wilson said something really smart about this recently and said that just thinking about it, people don't talk about how important it is to just walk around and think about it mm -hmm. and how you can be constantly percolating on something and so that when you sit down it feels like it's coming out whole but actually you've been doing your work for, for days. And I call it gathering periods. It makes me feel better about the fact that there are periods of non-writing. I'm just gathering, 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 gathering. Hopefully, I'm getting better at figuring out what to do when, they, when it gets onto the page. But. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit I have a terrible habit, which is smoking. And there are times, there's lots of times, where I'm sitting on my fire escape smoking, and then somebody comes up to talk to me, and I say, please, not right now. I'm writing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that percolation period is important. Yeah, cigarettes are also important to the process. <laughs> I have been quit for six years, and I am a poor writer for it. <laughs> I really am. Other questions? Hi. Um, you do a lot of nonfiction as well right now. Uh, how is that process different than percolating on um, your narrative? For those of you in the back, the question is oh, nonfiction writing and how it 
it's different. And how it's different. Um, I think it slightly depends on the form of the nonfiction. So some of some of the pieces that I have been writing are uh, sports writing, and you know, within that there could be an op-ed or it could be a profile. Um, then there are other long-form features that I've done that are more narrative. And then there's also like criticism, right, which is also nonfiction, or essay writing, which could be a combination of many different forms. Um, so it does it does kind of depend specifically on that. But I think that with nonfiction, I don't necessarily uh, worry as much about it because I'm trying to do my best with somebody else's story. And I understand that I'm never going to be able to fully capture their life. Um, so that, that takes a lot off. I think we have time for one more question. And then I hope you'll stay and have drinks and buy books and uh, talk amongst yourself after that. So, cool. Um, what, what projects are you, or what would you like to be writing next? I am, I am sort of starting research on a new novel right now, um, Top Secret. Actually, it's about Top Secrets. Um, so. <laughs> In other words, it's, uh, I am sort of researching uh, espionage, um, and so I, I think that that is going to be uh, my next large work. In the short term, I'm, I've been really loving narrative, long form, uh, nonfiction, and so I would definitely Well, Tracy can answer all of your questions in the back as you buy her book, and she'll be happy to sign it. So thank you, Tracy, and thank, thank you for this view.